Good morning and welcome to our live stream worship at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. I welcome all of you and I'm glad that you are with us this morning. I want to say a thank you to Pastor Will Pujol for filling in for me last week so that I could go and spend Father's Day with my dad for the first time in a lot of years. So I'm glad I got to go. So I invite you to join me in worship this morning. Uh, we begin with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust in your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace through God, through Jesus Christ. Whom we have, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another 
Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. First lesson for this fourth Sunday of Pentecost is from the prophet Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people, the prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, pestilence against many countries and great realms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the world of that prophet comes, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is portions of Psalm 89. I invite you to read them in unison with me. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age, my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your steadfast love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will, I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily in your name. They are jubilant in righteousness, for you are the glory of their strength. And by your favor, our might is exalted. Truly, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, the Holy One of Israel. second lesson is from Romans. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present any parts of your bodies to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourself to God as, though, as those who have been brought from death to life. And present your bodies to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves... You are slaves to the one who, whom, obey you, whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to form the teaching to which you were entrusted. And that having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. <coughs> I am speaking now in human terms because of your natural limitations. Just as you once were presented, just as you once presented the parts of your body as slaves to impurity, and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were freed in regard to righteousness. 
So what advantage did you get from things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God. The advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward, the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. A cup of cold water. It doesn't seem like much, does it? But even a cup of cold water can make all the difference in the world. To explain what I mean, I want to tell you a parable of sorts, a story. It is a parable of hospitality, of kindness. It is a parable of conviction, a parable of goodness, forgiveness, and grace, because a cup of cold water matters. A story play takes place in Blessington. It's my story. I can name the town anything I want to. So, Blessington is a very small town, not so far from here, really. It was the kind of place that people would say, hmm, I never heard of it. The citizens of Blessington are not, like, are not unlike most people anywhere these days. They just wanted to live in peace, have jobs and make a fair living, raise their families, watch their kids grow up. And they like church potlucks and backyard barbecues and fireworks and any of the time that they could be together. They didn't think much of politicians and they were wary of outsiders. They were content with their life and they didn't want anything to come and upset the apple cart, so to speak. Now, they were aware of all the things that happen around them in the world. They get the news in Blessington just like you do. But they were appalled and distinguished, disgusted just like you when they saw the evening news. And like you, you were glad, they are glad, that it just doesn't happen where we live. Or so we think. In many ways, in most ways, the people of Blessington were just like you and me. 
And like any small town, there were leading citizens in that town. Some of them are leading citizen wannabes, and they think more of their self than they should. And I'm going to tell you about four gentlemen that are just that. I want to tell you about the butcher who ran the local supermarket, the baker who ran a respectable bakery, made really good donuts, I'm told, the shoemaker who made shoes and repaired shoes for everybody in town. If you had bad feet, he could fix you up. And the last of all was the banker, a round, jolly fellow who loved money. He'd been in charge of the bank for a long, long time. And if you wanted a loan, you had to see him. Now, these four leading citizens would come together every Friday afternoon at the barber shop, and they would hold court. They talked, they argued, they discussed, they gossiped like men do, though it is mostly women who get blamed for it. They would sit in the barber shop smoking their fat cigars, vile things, watching people out of the great big plate glass window. And everybody that walked past the window was a topic of conversation. Old Mrs. Charlesworth walked by, hunched over, using a cane, something more than 85. She was on her way to the grocery store, just like every Friday afternoon. And it was hard enough to watch her walk to the grocery store, obviously with a painful gait as she walked by. But it was worse when she came back, trying to carry several sacks of groceries and walk with a cane at the same time. Really can't do that. Why doesn't that old woman get a car or have somebody take her to the store for heaven's sake? That's what the baker said. And the butcher said, yeah, she comes in every Friday. She's a bit of an old grouch though, which is why nobody wants to take her anywhere. And as she passed by, they saw two women crossing the street to go into the dollar store. Their conversation took a lull for just a moment. These two ladies, these two women, shared a house on 8th Street. And the men's conversation grew hushed with snickering that wasn't so quiet and almost squealing, you know what kind of girls they are. Then there was the Applegate family. They had seven children and mom came by with all seven kids running, jumping and a little rowdy. And the banker said, those kids are out of control. You know what the Bible says? Spare the rod, spoil the child. You know that Mr. Applegate came by the bank the other day and asked for a loan. He's just the janitor at the school. And the baker inquired, how much did he want? And without missing a beat, the banker said, $10,000. Did you give it to him? Of course not. There are no secrets in a small town like Blessington. The door opened and in walked Mr. Waters. He went right up to the barber and asked if he could get a haircut today. And the barber said, well, sure. It'll be a little while. These gentlemen have come in before you. And Mr. Waters said, okay, I can come back in about an hour. Will you still be open then? The barber smiled and said, sure, I'll wait for you. Mr. Waters turned and left. And the eyes of all four of those men were wide open and they all spoke at once. You're going to cut his hair? Oh my gosh, what's that like? 
I'm glad I'm before him. You see, Mr. Waters was African American. Everybody else in town was white. I have a question for you. Did you just assume everybody else in town was white? Did you consciously consider that there might be people of color living in that town? If you didn't think about it, were you surprised when I told you everyone was white except for these two? Many white folks are surprised by something like that. It isn't just something we think about, at least initially. It's as if we assume everybody is like us, everybody is white like us. And when they're not, we're suspect. Some of us do that more than others. That's what white privilege is all about. It's making assumptions and value judgments based on your own experience and perception of reality and your own socialization with an expectation that you're right, always. And that what you have, you deserve. And you're unwilling to give it up. And that in and of itself doesn't make us bad people. It's how it plays out in the world that's another story altogether. And it is at the heart of so much of what is happening around us. As far as anyone in town could tell, Mr. and Mrs. Waters were the only African Americans ever to live in Blessington. But that wasn't true. There are some really, really old pictures of the town when the town was just getting started of an African-American man and his wife and their children. They lived in Blessington with their children when it was established. They were actually one of the founding families of the town, but nobody remembers it. Nobody talks about it. And then Tom walked by. Tom was a little boy about 11 years old. And everybody knew Tommy. He lived with his mother who had three jobs, none of them full time. They were all part time jobs, so she had no benefits. And mostly she worked the night shift, but sometimes she came home from all night working sleep slept about an hour, and then she had to go one, to one of her other jobs. It was an impossible life. The poor woman was exhausted, burned out and depressed. Where was Tommy's father? I don't know. There were rumors, of course, that he was just simply absent, and Tom's mother would never talk about him. They lived in a house on the edge of town that looked like it would fall down the next time the wind blew. They had no money. All the money she made went to pay the rent for that broken down old house to keep the heat on and the electricity on. And then with what small amount was left over, she would buy groceries. Blessington did have a food pantry, but it was for emergencies only. And you could only go once a month. It was not intended to provide regular assistance, which is what she needed. For some dumb reason, she didn't qualify for SNAP or what used to be called food stamps. 
The truth is that Tom was lucky to get even one meal a day, and it was never very much, and it was never nutritious. It isn't that Tom's mother didn't love him, she did. It's why she worked so many hours. She was doing the best she could. But the reality was that Tom had to fend for himself most of the time. But I need you to know that Tom was not the kind of boy that got himself into mischief. In fact, the opposite was true. Do you remember old Mrs. Charlesworth walking with her cane and carrying groceries? Tom met her every Friday, took her groceries from her, and walked home with her. Almost no one knew that. When Mr. Appigate needed help cleaning limbs from his yard because a tree had fallen in a windstorm, his kids were all too young to help. So Tom was there without even being asked to help him do it. And then when Mr. and Mrs. Waters moved to town, Tom was there to help them unload their U-Haul and take stuff into the house. The truth is that almost everyone in town received some sort of help from Tom. Now, I know what you're thinking, that <clears throat> this is silly and you think I'm making all of this up and of course I'm making it up. It's my story, but I'm doing it for a reason. Because I want to ask you, Who do you think the little ones were Jesus was talking about? And what is this cup of cold water of which he speaks? Maybe most people think of little ones as children. Tom was, even at 11, still a child. But you could also think of older kids or even adults who are innocent and helpless as children, who can't seem to fend for themselves somehow. Maybe most people who need help from us, we think of as lesser, diminished in some way because they got themselves into a situation in which they needed help. But what if the point Jesus is trying to make is exactly the opposite? That it's not so much about the help that is offered, though that is a necessary part, but it's also about our perception of those that come to us in need of help. And the clue for me is here. Everyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. If you help a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. If you help a righteous person, you get the right reward of the righteous. And if you give even someone who needs a cup of cold water, then you and he receive the same reward. People are good about welcoming those who are like them or those who see them in some hierarchical matter that outranks them in hopes of being raised up to that level. But here it just isn't prophets or the righteous that deserve welcome. Even the little ones deserve an equal share of welcome, an equal share of hospitality. What if the cup of water given in the name of a disciple
does not create a sense of dependence, but rather establishes equality and relationship. They are like us and we are like them. If we could think about people like that, how would our world be changed? If we could see everyone as our brothers and sisters, would it change the way that we see the poor, the hungry, refugees, immigrants? Would it change the way that we approach COVID-19 or racism? I think Jesus means that we're all little ones at one time or another in need of help and kindness and justice and fairness and certainly in need of saving. We are all in need of this grace from God. And others are also in need of God's grace that he offers through us. Remember, whoever welcomes Jesus welcomes the Father who sent him. And the smallest act of kindness matters. Even a cup of cold water matters. An invitation matters. A look of acceptance matters. Welcome matters. So back to Blessington. They were getting ready for the town's 4th of July celebration, and it was a really big deal. Everybody in town came. There was a big picnic with fried chicken and baked beans and the best pies in the world, I guess. There would be fireworks and there were speeches. Everyone in town was there from the least of them to the greatest of them, as if there really were such a thing. The speeches were about the town's founding, its history and its progress. Some of the folks were descendants of those founders and they were held in high esteem. The current leaders of the town were also held in high esteem, which is why the butcher, the baker, the shoemaker, and the banker all made themselves very, very visible because they all thought that they were the most important persons in town. And they knew that somebody had suggested that the most important person in town be named so that they could be lifted up above everybody, and go up on the stage and be identified and their picture put in the town hall. Yeah, I know that sounds far-fetched, but people do that sort of thing all the time. We're all the time identifying those who are the most distinguished. We're identifying those who are our champions. So the people of Blessington actually argued about this for two hours. And finally, when she could take it no more, Mrs. Charlesworth struggled to get up. Tom was way in the back, saw her, and ran up to help her. And he helped her up the steps as she, and across the stage. And she took the microphone out of the MC's hand and pushed him aside. And here's what she said. You all think you know who the most important person in this town is, but you don't. That's because you're blind and full of yourselves. She said, I'll tell you who it is. It's the person, he's the one 
who is always there to help when you need help. He's the one who goes out of his way to be kind. He's the one that demonstrates the kind of sacrificial love that God calls us to that we talk about and never seem to be able to pull off. And she fell silent and looked over the crowd as if she waited for someone to answer and no one had the courage to do it. So she finally said, I tell you who it is. It's Tom. Because Tom is always there. Tom is always kind. Tom is always ready to help. And he never asks anything in return. He does not expect payment, even though his need is great. Now, I don't know whether they put Tom's picture up or not. You think I would know it's my story, right? But I know people well enough to know <coughs> they don't always do what they should do. People are fickle. I tell you what I do know. Hospitality is worth more than we give it credit for. Hospitality isn't something that we do now and then to people that we think are like us. Instead, hospitality looks for the little ones. But in order to lift them up, hospitality is a holy thing. It leads to genuine community. It strengthens the bonds of fellowship that we share with each other and with Christ. And Christ is the one who offered himself for all of us in no small ways. Christ crucified and risen is everything. And if Jesus welcomes all, how can we not? I know it's a difficult and confusing world. And there are so many who are lost. But this is a world in which even a cup of cold water offered in Jesus' name makes all the difference. Amen. The hymn we sing is All Who Hunger Gladly Gather. Christ.
confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and with the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. <clears throat> God of companionship, encourage our relationships with our siblings in Christ. Bless our conversations, shape our shared future, and give us hearts eager to join in a festal shout of praise. Hear us, O God. God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O God. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities, judges, and politicians to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, to meet hate with love, and welcome one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O oh God. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Comfort those who are sick, lonely or abandoned. We especially remember Mike and Peggy Crawford, Anne, Greg, Joella and family, Dorothy, Dwayne McDonald, Mike, Butch, the Moss family, Tony, Brindley, Rosalie, Gladys Fisher, Ricky Hensley, Stuart and Jennifer Daisy, Ashley, Ashley Ella, Erica, Megan, and Carl, Donna, Elaine, Elaine and Don, Bob, Evan, Chan, Tucker, Karen Harlow, Patty, Chase Tetzloff, Cole Tetzloff, Misty Tetzloff, Linda, Andy Tetzloff, Marsha Wooldridge, Shane, Greg Letcher, Betty Marie Henderson, Patty Cobble, Ed Erkowitz, Charles and Mary McDonald, Patricia, Mary, Greg, Debbie Jones, Jeff Smith, Paul, Pam, Brian, Jeanette Mull, Cagney Steelman, Merrills Abels, Ilna, and Walter Nesbitowski. Hear us, O oh God. <clears throat> God of saving grace, call us into a deeper relationship to be your church for the sake of the world.
Help us to see with new eyes the injustices within the church and society. Call us to have a loving heart that respects and uplifts all humanity and dignity of every person. Give us insight to see racism within and the humility to confess the truth about ourselves. Open our ears to listen to and learn from the experiences of people of color. Open our mouths to speak boldly with conviction about injustices. Join us with others to work for racial equality and inclusion for all people. Hear us, O oh God. <clears throat> God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission with the vision to recognize where you are leading us. We are weak, where we are weak, reluctant, afraid, angry, and resistant. We pray for your Holy Spirit, who will work to raise us up to be your church, to be your people. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O oh God. God of love, you gather in your embrace all who have died especially Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O God. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I will prepare a table now for communion. I invite you to get your bread and wine or grape juice if you haven't already done so and bring them closer to you. I thank you for remembering your church in this time of pandemic separation. Your generosity and commitment to Holy Trinity are much appreciated. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in our world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. I'm sorry, I'm going to have a little trouble getting through this, I can tell, so please bear with me. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your 
hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and <coughs> praise. It is our duty and delight that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, who calls us to follow his way of humble service and love. And so with the church on earth, all creation and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord of power and might. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in you. God, our maker, redeemer, and healer. In the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. <clears throat> Remembering therefore his acts of healing, his body given up and his victory over death. We await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us in this meal as grains scattered on the hillside become one bread. So let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth that they may be fed with the bread of life, your son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to take your bread, the body of Christ given for you. the blood of Christ given for you. <clears throat> Let us pray. 
God of the welcome table, in this meal we have fasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. We sing, I love to tell the story. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.